Hello, this is Serene from Exam Help Verb. Today I will be solving physics paper 2 AS level structured questions 9702 variant 2 major in 2019. Question number 1 part A. The diameter of a cylinder is measured as 0 0.0125 meters of percentage un uncertainty 1.6%. Calculate the absolute uncertainty in this measurement. Okay, so one which is given to us in the question over here is percentage uncertainty. Let's convert it to absolute uncertainty of diameter d. We'll divide 1.6 with 100 and multiply it with the value of diameter d. And this gives us absolute uncertainty as 2 into 10 to the power of negative 4. Part B. The cylinder in part A stands on a horizontal surface. The pressure P ex exerted on the surface by the cylinder is given by P is equals to 4 into weight divided by pi d squared. The measured weight of the cylinder is 0.38 newtons plus minus 2.8 percentage. Part 1. Calculate the pressure P. Okay. So 4 multiplied by weight which is given to us as 0.38. This whole gets divided by pi into d square. d can be taken from part 1 which is 0 0.0125. This whole should be squared. And the answer for pressure P is 3096.52. But we need to convert. Uh, let's make it to two significant figures. So this becomes 3100. Part 2. Determine the absolute uncertainty in the value of pressure P. So let's start with percentage uncertainty of W is, is 2.8%. Percentage uncertainty of D is 1.6. Since we are taking it twice, so percentage uncertainty of D is 1.6 into 2, which is equal to 3.2%. We'll add them up. So total percentage uncertainty becomes 6%. Now we'll divide 6 with 100. And we'll multiply it with the value of pressure P because we are finding absolute uncertainty in the value of P. Our value of pressure P was 3096.52. And this gives us absolute uncertainty of pressure P as 185.8. But our last two uncertainties were corrected to two significant figures. So this becomes plus or minus. 190 newtons per meter square question number two part a state newton's second law of motion so second newton's law uh, has the equation f is equals to m into a but you should try explaining this question in terms of momentum even though it's not asked in the question so second law of motion in terms of momentum is that force is directly proportional to rate of change of momentum since a is equals to v minus u divided by t so resultant force will be equals to m into v minus u divided by t Part B, a car of mass 850 kilograms tows a trailer in a straight line along a horizontal road as shown in figure 2.1 the car and the trailer are connected to by a horizontal tow bar. The variation with time of the velocity v of the car for a part of its journey is shown in figure 2.2. It's a straight line with a positive gradient and then this while over here it's a straight line which means that the speed is constant within this time interval and then there is a straight line again but this time with a negative gradient means the uh, this is deceleration.
Part 1, calculate the distance traveled by the car from t is equals to 0 to t is equals to 10 seconds. Distance is equals to area under the graph of speed versus time. So from t is equals to 0 until t is equals to 10. So this can be considered a trapezium and area of trapezium half into height into sum of parallel sides height can be considered from 0 to 10 and sum of parallel sides means this is a uh, these two lines over here this one and this one they are parallel to each other so we need to take their lengths i'll write the equation area is equals to half into height into sum of parallel sides half into height of our trapezium in figure 2.2 .2 is 0 to 10 means the height is of 10 seconds so 10 into our parallel sides are this one and this one so the length of the first parallel side is 9 and the second one is 13 so 9 plus 13 and this one gives us the answer as 110 meters. part 2 at time t is equals to 10 seconds the resistive force acting on the car due to air resistance and friction is 510 newtons the tension in the tow bar is 440 newtons for the car at time t is equals to 10 seconds part 1 use figure 2.2 to calculate the acceleration so at this time interval you have to find the acceleration of the car so when we go up to figure 2.2 .2, at t is equals to 10 seconds you need to find the acceleration since it's a straight line from t is equals to 0 seconds until uh, t is equals to 10 seconds or I should say from t is equals to 0 second to, two, to t is equals to 12.5 seconds. Uh, so acceleration at any point within this interval uh, time interval is the same. So the two speeds I will be taking is 14 and 13. So 14 minus 13 divided by time interval from the change in speed from 13 to 14 is 2.5 seconds and this is how i get the acceleration as 0 0.40 meters per second square so i'll go down again and i'll mention over here you can take any value because it will give you the same acceleration within the time interval from t is equals to 0 to t is equals to 12.5 seconds so i'll write 0 0.40 meters per second square but to use your answer to calculate the resultant force acting on the car so the formula is resultant force is equals to mass multiplied by acceleration resultant force is equals to mass of the car is 850 kilograms this will be multiplied by the acceleration i deduced from part one and this gives us the answer as 340 newtons part three showed that the horizontal force of 1300 newtons ex exerted on the car by its engine so the question says that a frictional force is acting towards the left with a magnitude of 500 newtons means towards the left over here and then tension of 440 newtons also acts and tension must be acting towards the left too since uh, it is going to be acting against the car pulling force car pulling force is just nothing but the engine's force so tension plus frictional force will be acting against the engine force a greater force should be acting on the car or I should say that a, a, some force must be acting towards the right so that resultant force is positive 340 newtons uh, positive in sense because it's accelerating at t is equals to 10 seconds so I'll write I'll consider force acting towards the right as x minus the sum of the forces acting towards the left which is the frictional force that is 510 plus the tension which is also acting towards the left of the car and then the resultant is positive 340 newton and this is how i get the value of x as 1290 newtons and then I'll round it to two significant figures which becomes 1300 newtons
Part 4. Determine the useful output power of the engine. So power is equals to force into velocity of the car. Force over here will be the exerted force or the engine's force which we calculated in part 3. 1300 multiplied by the velocity of the car at t is equals to 10 seconds. 30 meters per second and this is how we get power of 16900 watts and again I'll correct it to two significant figures which becomes 17,000 watts. Part C a short time later the car in part B is traveling at a constant speed and the tension in the tow bar is 480 newtons. The tow bar is a solid metal rod that obeys Hooke's law. Some data for the tow bar are listed below. Young modulus of metal is given to you. Original length of tow bar is given to you. Cross-sectional area of tow bar has also been given to you. We are asked to determine the extension of the tow bar. So I, first of all, I'll write all the possible formulae related to this question. So my first formula would my first formula would be Young modulus is equal to stress over strain. Our stress is equal to force divided by cross-sectional area and our strain is equal to extension divided by original length so we already have the young modulus we have uh, the original length as well as the cross-sectional area so we can rearrange the formula and we can easily uh, determine the extension of the tow bar 2.2 into 10 to the power of 11 is equal to 480 is the force given to us. We'll divide it by the cross-sectional area which is 3 into 10 to the power of negative 4. And this whole gets divided by extension over original length. So again extension is what we have to calculate. Original length is 0.48 meters. And when we rearrange the formula and make extension the subject of the formula, we get the extension as 3.5 into 10 to the power of negative 6 meters. Part D, the driver of the car in part B, see the train standing directly ahead in this distance. The driver operates the horn of the car from time t is equal to 15 seconds to time t is equal to 17 seconds. The frequency of the sound heard by the pedestrian heard by the pedestrian is 480 hertz. The speed of the sound in the air is 340 meters per second. Use figure 2.2 to calculate the frequency of the sound emitted by the horn. Okay, so formula related to this question is observed frequency. Means the frequency which will be heard by the person standing there is equal to the frequency of the source of the sound which is the horn which is obviously the car frequency of the source this gets multiplied with the speed of sound in air and this whole gets divided by speed of sound in air in air minus or plus but I'll only add the subtraction sign because this uh, because in this question source of sound is approaching the observer so negative sign speed of sound of source so observed frequency is given to us over here 480 Hertz which is equal to frequency of the source which is asked to be calculated so I'll denote it with X and then this gets multiplied with speed of sound in air which is 340 meters per second this whole gets divided by speed of sound in air which is 340 meters per second minus speed of sound of source at t is equals to 15 seconds to t is equals to 17 seconds which can be taken from figure 2.2 from 15 to 17 this one is 17.5 so 17 must be somewhere here so 17 to 15 a constant speed of 14 meters per second so minus 14 and this is how you get a value of frequency of the source as 
460 hertz. Question number three, part A state, what is meant by the center of gravity of a body? This is a commonly asked question in physics paper. So you all must uh, by heart the definition of center of mass or center of gravity of somebody. So this is a point where an object's weight seems to act on. Part B, a uniform square sign with sides of length 0.68 meters is fixed at its corner points A and B to a wall. The sign is also supported by a wire CD as shown in figure 3.1. The sign has weight W and the center of gravity at point E. The sign is held in a vertical plane with side BC horizontal. The wire is at an angle of 35 degrees to side BC. The tension in the wire is 54 newtons. The force exerted on the sign at B is only in the vertical direction. Part 1. Calculate the vertical component of the tension in the wire. Over here, the tension is at an angle of 35 degrees to side BC, which means that this tension has got a horizontal component as well as a vertical component. So its vertical component is equal to 54 newtons multiplied by the sine of the angle to the horizontal which is 35 degrees and this gives us the answer as 31 newtons part 2 explain why the force on the sine and b does not have a moment about point b so for moment to take place at point a we need to have a b which should be perpendicular to the force exerted on the b whereas in the question it is mentioned that the force exerted on B is a vertical force, which means that the force is either acting upwards or downwards. Whereas for moment to take place at point A, we need to have that force acting either towards the right of the B or towards the left of the B. So the answer is force at B passes right through point A. Part 3, by taking moments about point A, show that the weight W of the sign is 150 newtons. Okay. So, board is in static position, which means its uh, clockwise moment is definitely equal to its anti-clockwise moment. Its clockwise moment will all be due to the weight and its an total anti-clockwise moment will be due to the tension which has got a horizontal component as well as a vertical component so taking them into account we need to write clockwise moment is equal to anti-clockwise moment our clockwise moment is due to weight w weight should be multiplied by the perpendicular distance from force w to the moment point which is a so distance between point w and point a is half of point 68 this is equal to total anti-clockwise moment which is due to the tension but remember tension t is at an angle to bc so we must take both its components into account so we have got its vertical component all as well as its horizontal component so for its vertical component we need to write 52 sine 35 this gets multiplied with the perpendicular distance between the vertical component of 54 and point a so the vertical component acts upwards over here this way and A, the distance between A and the vertical component of tension 54 is 0.68 meters. So I'll multiply it with 0.68. Now we also need to take the horizontal component of tension A in account, which is this one. So the force is acting this way. We need to have a perpendicular distance between the force acting and point A. So the, so the distance, so the perpendicular distance between this force acting towards the left and A is 0.68 meters. So I'll take 54 cos 35. 
and this gets multiplied with 0.68 meters and this is how I get a value for weight which is equal to 150 newtons part 4 calculate the total vertical force exerted by the wall on the sign at points A and B okay since the board is at rest position this means its upward forces has to be equal to its total downward forces as you have seen that its weight is greater than the tensions vertical component the extension vertical component is what we calculated in part 1 over here 31 newtons however we are getting a weight of 510 newtons which which means that the board shouldn't be balanced but it is balanced which means that some force might be still acting upwards and this is and this is due to the forces acting on both A and B. This means that vertical forces on A and B are acting upwards and have a sum of and they have a sum of 120 newtons, which is 150 minus 31. Part C, the sign in part B is held together by nuts and bolts. One of the nut falls vertically from rest through a distance of 4.8 meters to the pavement below. The nut lands on the pavement with a speed of 9.2 meters per second. Determine for the nut falling from the sign to the pavement the ratio change in gravitational potential energy divided by final kinetic energy. So gravitational potential energy is equal to m into g into h. Mass has not been given to us, we will just take m, we will multiply it with 9.81 and then multiply it with the height difference which it is distance it is covering is 4.8 and this gives us the value of 47.09 joules. Kinetic energy is equal to half of mass into velocity square since we don't have the mass so we'll just take m we'll multiply it with velocity square its final velocity is 9.2 so 9.2 square and this gives us the value as 42.32 joules and when we divide 47.09 with 42.32 we get a ratio of 1.1 and both the m get cancelled question number four part a for aggressive water wave state what is meant by part one displacement this displacement is basically distance from the equilibrium position This comes from the uh, displacement versus distance graph where displacement is on the y-axis and distance is on the x-axis. Part 2 amplitude, it is the maximum displacement. Again, this comes from the displacement versus distance graph. Part B, two coherent waves x and y meet at a point and superpose. The phase difference between the waves at the point is 180 degrees. Wave x has an amplitude of 1.2 centimeters and Intensity I, wave Y has an amplitude of 3.6 meters centimeters. Calculate in terms of I the resultant intensity at the meeting point. Directly proportional to intent amplitude square. So in this question, I'll take the ratio of both the intensities and their amplitudes. So intensity of X divided by the resultant uh, intensity, which I'll be denoting with IR. This is equal to the amplitude square of intensity X, which is 1.2 square. This gets divided by the amplitude square of the resultant intensity, which is... 
which is 2.4 square. 2.4 comes from 3.6 minus 1.2. We need to subtract the amplitudes of both the waves to get the amplitude of the resultant wave since it's a destructive interference because of the phase difference of being 180 degrees. So when I rearrange the formula and make resultant intensity the subject of the formula, I get IR as 4 times of intensity of wave x. Part C1, monochromatic light is incident on a diffraction grating. Describe the diffraction of the light waves as they pass through the grating. For this, you need to know what the diffraction grating is all about. So as the wave passes through slits, they spread out. Part 2. A parallel beam of light consists of two wavelengths 540 nanometers and 630 nanometers. The light is incident normally on a diffraction grating. The third order diffraction maxima are produced for each of the two wavelengths. No higher orders are produced for either wavelength. Determine the smallest possible line spacing D of the diffraction grating. So first of all, I'll write the formula for the diffraction grating which is D sine theta. This is equal to n multiplied by lambda. For smallest d, we need lambda to be of greater value. So I'll take 630 nanometers rather than 540 nanometers. And later on in the question, I'll explain you why I chose 630 nanometers over 540 nanometers. When I substitute all the values in the respective places, I'll get a value of d is equal to 1.9 into 10 to the power of minus 6 meters. Part 3, beam of light in C, part 2 is replaced by a beam of blue light incident on the same diffraction grating. State and explain whether a third order diffraction maximum is produced for this blue light. Since this blue light has a lot smaller wavelength than either 630 nanometers and 540 nanometers, so it's possible for third order maximum to form. Because all the shorter wavelengths than 630 nanometers will require a smaller d than 1.9 into 10 to the power of minus 6 meters. However, wavelengths that are of greater magnitude than 630 nanometers will want a bigger d, which means their maximums forming will be less than what happens in this question. So, yes. Third order maximum forms because blue light has a shorter wavelength as compared to 540 nanometers or 630 nanometers. This also explains uh, the previous part why I took why I chose 630 nanometers over 540 nanometers because if I had taken 540 nanometers this would have given me a smaller d which would not have made possible for six, for the wavelength for the light which is of 630 nanometers wavelength to pass through the slit. So we need a greater distance between the slits to make possible for both the lights to pass through. Question number 5 part A state Kirchhoff. Second law this is sum of EMFs around the loop is equal to sum of PDs around the loop. Part B, a battery of electromotive force 5.6 volts and internal resistance R is connected to two external resistors as shown in figure 5.1. The reading on the voltmeter over here is 4.8 volts. Part 1. Calculate the combined resistance of the two resistors connected in parallel. In parallel is equal to both the resistances they get multiplied with each other and that gets divided by the sum of the both the resistances which is 90 and 18. This gives us the answer as 15 ohms. Part 2 the current in the battery. So total resistance of external resistors is equal to 15 ohms. Total PD 
across those external resistors 4.8 volts now that we have the resistance across the external resistors and the PD across the resistor you can easily calculate the current flowing across it so I is equals to V divided by R which means 4.8 that gets divided by 15 and we get a value of 0.32 amperes but to show that the internal resistance is 2.5 ohms okay so using Kirchhoff's second law total EMF across the loop which is of 5.6 volts should be equal to total PDs across the loop meaning PD across the external resistors which is 4.8 volts plus PD across the internal resistance of the battery so this means that 5.6 is equal to 4.8 and the internal resistance which is equal to the current across that internal resistance multiplied by the internal resistance so the current across the loop is 0.32 amperes and this gets multiplied by the internal resistance and this is how we get the value of R as 2.5 ohms part 3 determine the ratio power dissipated by internal resistance R and total power produced by battery so formula for power dissipation is resistance multiplied by current square so the power dissipated by internal resistance will be equal to 2.5 multiplied by 0.32 square and this whole gets divided by the power total power produced by battery which is current into voltage current was 0.32 this gets multiplied by the voltage or the emf of the battery which is 5.6 volts and we get our ratio as 0.14 part c the battery in part b is now connected to a battery of emf 7.2 volts and internal resistance 3.5 ohms the new circuit is shown in figure 5.2 determine the current in the circuit so over here in the diagram as you can see that same terminals of two batteries are facing each other means the positive of this battery and the positive of this battery they both are facing each other so total emf of the whole loop is gonna be 7.2 minus 5.6 which is equal to 1.6 volts so 1.6 volts is the emf of the whole loop now the total resistance of our circuit or our loop is since they are connected in series so we'll add them up and so our total resistance is 6 ohms now that we have got the total resistance of the circuit as well as the total emf of the circuit we can easily calculate the current in the circuit which is voltage divided by the resistance means 1.6 means 1.6 divided by 6 and we get an answer as 0.27 amperes suppose if the positive of this battery was facing the negative of this battery i would have taken the sum of both the emfs to get the combined emf of the circuit but since it's in this question they both are facing each other with the same terminals i had to subtract both the emfs to get the combined emf of the circuit question number six part a state what is meant by a field line in an electrical field that's again something which you have to learn by heart and that's direction in which positive charge moves part b an electrical field has two different regions x and y the field strength in x is less than that in y describe a difference between the pattern of field lines in x and in y usually in this kind of question you have to describe answer in terms of separation between the field lines so wherever strength is more field lines are supposed to be closer to each other than in that area where strength is less so i'll write that at y separation between the field lines is less than at x
a particle p has a mass of 0.15 u and a charge of negative e where e is the elementary charge means e has a magnitude of 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs part one particle p and an alpha particle are in the same uniform electric field calculate the ratio magnitude of acceleration of particle p divided by magnitude of acceleration of alpha particle okay so acceleration is equal to the resultant force divided by mass i'll take force in terms of electrical field strength and charge so my acceleration now is equal to electric field strength multiplied by the charge and this divided by mass acceleration of particle p is going to be equal to since we are not given with electric field strength it says that both of them move in the same uniform electric field means value of e for both p and alpha particle they are going to be equal so i'll just write e this gets multiplied with the charge now the charge for particle p it says that it has charge of negative e which means it has charge of 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19 and this whole gets divided by the mass of particle p which is in which is given to us in terms of u in this question we need to convert that to kilograms so i'll multiply 0.15 and u has a value of 1.66 into 10 to the power of negative 27 kilograms 6.43 into 10 to the power of 8 meters per second square now i'll come to acceleration of alpha particle again electric field strength is not given to us but value for both the electric field strengths for particle b and alpha particle they are going to be equal so e the e gets multiplied with the charge of alpha particle for the charges i'll only take the charge of the protons but not the electrons so i'll multiply alpha particle has got two protons alpha particle is nothing but a helium atom and a helium atom has got two protons so i'll multiply two with 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19 this whole gets multiplied with the mass of alpha particle alpha particle has got two neutrons and two protons compared to the electron has got a very negligible mass so i won't be considering a uh, number of electrons in the mass i'll only be taking four into 1.6 6 into 10 to the power of negative 27 and this is how i get a value of acceleration as 4.82 into 10 to the power of 7 meters per second square now now when i divide the acceleration of particle b with acceleration of alpha particle i get a ratio of 13 <clears throat> part 2 particle p is a hadron composed of only two quarks one of them is a down quark by considering charge to determine a possible type flavor of the other quark explain your working since in the beginning of this part the total or the, uh, the total charge for particle p was given to us which is negative e so you first need to know that a down quark has got a charge of negative 1 by 3 e and the total charge for particle p is negative e and it has got only two quarks so the first quark is negative 1 by 3 e the second one is unknown to us so i'll take it as x this should be equal to the combined charge of particle p which is negative e given to us in the beginning of the question when i rearrange my formula this becomes x now has a value of negative 2 by 3 e so the second quark of particle in particle p has a charge of negative 2 by 3 and that quark is anti-up quark or if you want a symbol for anti-up quark that is u for up and then you put dash on the top okay so this concludes our paper thank you for watching